Hi and welcome to the Stefan Levera podcast focused on Bitcoin and Austrian economics. Today we are speaking with Jan Pritzker, author of Inventing Bitcoin. But first, a word for the sponsors. So firstly, Kraken, one of the premier Bitcoin exchanges, one of the longest standing Bitcoin exchanges. They're consistently rated the best. They have a high quality platform. They've got high trading volume and low fees with no minimum or hidden fees. Don't forget, they've got 24-7 support. They offer best-in-class accounting, reconciliation, and reporting services. They've recently just launched Kraken Pro mobile app where you generate an API key from the Kraken website. There is also the Kraken OTC desk for more private, personalized service for large block trades. That's 100K USD or more. And there's also Kraken margin up to 5X and futures up to 50 times leverage to benefit from price swings or to hedge your price risk. So go to kraken.com. There's a link in the show notes. This podcast is also brought to you by Unchained Capital. Unchained Capital is a Bitcoin financial services company empowering customers with unprecedented financial freedom and control. All of the products and services are built on the foundation of multi-sig, and this approach to collaborative custody gives users control over their private keys as well as the benefit of a financial partner and financial services. Unchained's two of three vaults are a great option for those thinking through how best to secure their Bitcoin for the long term. And if you ever need to access liquidity but don't want to sell your Bitcoin, Unchained's collateralized loans offer a unique option. All the Bitcoin is stored on chain, dedicated multi sig addresses, it's never rehypothecated, and you can share in the security by holding one of three keys. So I'm impressed by Unchained. They offer excellent services, they're releasing valuable content and open source tools. So I think you'll enjoy partnering with them for your Bitcoin financial services. Go find out more at unchained capital.com. Last but not least, CypherSafe. They're producing the Cypher Wheel product. So are you keeping your Bitcoin seed backed up in a way that's fireproof, waterproof, rust-proof, pet-proof, and tamper-evident? If not, look into Cypher Wheel. It's a new product. It comes in a wheel shape that masks the words of your seed, and it's actually got a tamper-evident seal. So make sure your seed is backed up to help you in case your paper seed backup is waterlogged or tampered or goes up in a fire. Make sure your loved ones have access to your Bitcoins if an accident occurs, and it's particularly important if you're in a single signature situation. So the product is available for pre-order. Check out the website, cyphersafe.io. The link is in the show notes. So today we've got an episode targeted for beginners. Jan was previously CTO of Reverb, but as he fell down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, he wanted to create a resource to teach Bitcoin beginners. I've had the opportunity to read his book, Inventing Bitcoin, and wanted to get him on the show to provide an intro on Bitcoin mining. His explanation on Bitcoin mining is very intuitive to grasp for a beginner. So make sure you share this episode with your Bitcoin beginner family and friends. Here's the interview. Jan, welcome to the show. Thanks, Stefan. It's great to be on. Yeah, so Jan, I know you've done a lot of cool stuff, uh, particularly with your book, Inventing Bitcoin. But uh, I'd love to have you tell us a little bit more about yourself and what was some of your background before you got into all this? Yeah, sure. So I have a little bit of an interesting story. Um, I came here to the United States when I was seven years old, uh, came from the former Soviet Union and uh, with my parents, obviously, and I got into computers at an early age. My dad um, saved up uh, what money we had, a little bit of money, and bought me a computer. So I grew up kind of coding, things like that. And then, you know, went to school for computer science and linguistics and uh, thought I was going to do uh, AI and things like that. But then I really got into startups. So I spent about, you know, 15 to 20 years, depending on when you start counting, um, doing startups. And um, being an early uh, co-founder, early engineer, a lot of startups, um, my last one was Reverb, Reverb.com, uh, which was a marketplace for musicians. Basically, we sold gear, uh, drums, uh, guitars, things like that, and just got acquired by Etsy, actually. So I'm real proud of, of the team there. Um, but around uh, 2016, I, I kind of started falling down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, as many people do once they <laughs> really start understanding Bitcoin. Um, I had actually known about Bitcoin uh, since 2011. And I'm ashamed to say that it took me five years from knowing about Bitcoin to actually like understanding what it was or even bothering to research it. Um, so, you know, it took me a while. But in 2016, I finally kind of sat down and started looking at, um, you know, Andreas's videos and reading every article I could get my hands on, listening to podcasts uh, and really started getting educated on this. And, you know, very quickly became kind of the Bitcoin guy in my group of friends, obviously, <laughs> which a lot of people have experienced that sort of, you know, that effect, right? Um, and started shilling Bitcoin at every opportunity. It got really annoying and um, decided that, uh, you know, I wanted to kind of 
figure out a way to, to explain Bitcoin to people a little bit better. And um, I actually started giving talks at a few high schools. I had friends who had been teachers. And uh, based on these talks, I started realizing that uh, I wanted to have a really simple way to explain Bitcoin. And that's kind of how I, I came to the book. I, re- I decided to, to basically write down those thoughts, uh, try to make it as short as possible. So the book's, you know, it's about 100 pages. Um, try to make it as digestible as possible for the regular sort of person, but at the same time, uh, make it technical enough so that you can understand how Bitcoin actually works. Uh, so yeah, that was, that was kind of my journey. I, I'm skipping over a lot of stuff, uh, that happened awesome. in the middle. I kind of had, you know, uh, some time where I explored uh, blockchain and ICO and Ethereum and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but eventually came around to the idea that Bitcoin is the only thing that matters. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> So Jan, you mentioned as well that you were from a former Soviet nation. So did that also play into your own understanding of Bitcoin as a uh, money? Yeah, I have to say that you know my experience was uh, in the Soviet Union. I, I grew up there, so my experience was as a kid. And as a kid, I didn't really understand that the environment I was in, you know, there was something wrong with it. Right? I just had a normal childhood. Uh, but my parents, you know, stood in line for bread. There was shortages of goods everywhere. Um, uh, but later on, when I got into Bitcoin, I started asking, I started sort of thinking back to what the Soviet Union was like uh, and asking my parents about it. Um, and one of the most interesting things I asked them about was what happened to our money when we left, right? Um, and what happened, as it turns out, is that the government allowed us to exchange about $100 per person uh, worth of currency with the Soviet ruble. Um, at the government controlled exchange rate. Obviously, the government controlled exchange rate was not the real exchange rate that was on the street um, because nobody wanted those rubles. So effectively, we were able to keep $100 per person. And so when I heard that, I started really thinking about what would life have been like if we had Bitcoin um, at that time, right? We would have been able to put a password into our head and, and walk out of the country with all the Bitcoin in our head, right? So it started to really kind of connect for me that uh, Bitcoin is exactly that. It's not really, um, I mean, if it's an inflation hedge, maybe that's kind of a nice thing. But what it's much more, what's much more important about Bitcoin is that it's a freedom hedge, right? It's a, it's a hedge against the government, like wanting to take all your stuff or not allowing you to leave the country with your wealth intact. Um, and that's, that's what really clicked for me when I um, understood our condition and how we kind of escaped the Soviet Union. We were lucky enough to be able to leave um, with what little we had, but if we had Bitcoin and we had been saving, you know, a little bit of our income in Bitcoin, uh, we would have been much better off, obviously. Yeah, I've often thought of Bitcoin as a kind of techno-libertarian answer to the techno-authoritarians. Yes, exactly. Right. It's exactly right. It changes the nature of the relationship, I think, between people and their government, right? Because um, in the Soviet Union, we were we were powerless to do anything because we had no economic freedom. So the government imposed the, the currency on us, right? The Soviet ruble. Um, they managed the, the whole economy. They planned everything. And so, of course, the, the, all kinds of things were screwed up, shortages and everything. Uh, the the money was devalued many, many times uh, by many factors of 100, 1,000, and so on. Um, but we weren't even allowed to own, for example, U.S. dollars, right? It was complete currency control. Uh, and you see this even today. This is not like something that happened back in the day. This is happening all over the world. I mean, in Argentina, Venezuela, countries like that, they're not going to want you to uh, flee the country with all that capital. So they need to lock things down. And when they lose that power, I think that really changes how people interact with their government. It's a, you know, It puts a real check on the government's ability to even try to do something like this. What I really enjoyed about your book is that it was really short and gives a high level explanation on different concepts and one of which is bitcoin mining i think it'd be good to walk through some of the examples from that so maybe we'll just uh role play so i'm, I'm going to be the bitcoin beginner and i'm going to ask you jan so look i heard about bitcoin should i do bitcoin mining <laughs> it's funny it's a funny question because i actually have gotten this question from beginners it's a very common co- question um, and I think the the problem with this question is the perception that Bitcoin mining is like, uh, well, it's it's honestly, it's the media's fault. Because if you read the articles, it says Bitcoin mining is done by computers by solving complex equations. Okay, so of course, everybody's like, well, why can't, you know, why can't my computer solve complex equations? Um, and it really misses the point of what mining is, right? So I think uh, the first thing I actually start with is by giving people a realistic um uh, a realistic view of what mining looks like nowadays, 
Um, people have to understand that mining is an industrial process. It's done by fairly large companies and, and at, at large scale with huge amounts of power. They need to be negotiating their power contracts to get a very, very cheap cost of power. They need to be buying their hardware in bulk to get cheaper hardware. They need to have uh, you know, the right tax structures in place to be able to like, write off that hardware, all this kind of stuff. These things need to happen uh, in order for mining to be profitable at scale. Um, so the answer to whether you should mine is no. Uh, as an individual, you should likely not mine. I mean, you may have some reasons to mine. For example, if you want to get your hands on quote unquote clean Bitcoins, right? Because by mining, you are generating the Bitcoins yourself. And that's kind of nice because uh, there you haven't logged into any exchange, you haven't interacted with anybody. You're literally generating them sort of out of thin air, but you know you're using you're using your electricity to pay for that. Um, but the downside of that is that you're not going to be profitable. You need specialized hardware and you need very cheap power. So unless you're willing to pay for that sort of anonymity um, through essentially over overspending compared to what you would have paid for on an exchange. Uh, I would not recommend mining. Right. And I think it, it also plays into that idea of what is the upfront capital cost required. Uh, mm -hmm. Typically, it might be much, much higher than the typical individual would be able to spend. Right. I mean, uh, you know, even a, like a, a brand new uh, mining machine might cost you a couple thousand dollars. Or even if you pick up a, an old one on the secondary market, well, that old one will take a lot longer to pay off because, you know, it, it's not as efficient. Um, so mining is kind of uh, you can think of it as a race to the bottom. Um, everybody's kind of competing to be the most efficient uh, possible. So everybody's trying to get the fastest hardware, the cheapest power. And if you're not in that top echelon of people with the cheapest power and the fastest hardware and the best operations team, uh, you know, being able to repair these things at scale, is you're not going to be profitable. It's going to be very difficult for you to be profitable. Right. Okay. So again, if I'm a Bitcoin beginner, I might have seen some ads online uh, about cloud mining. Should I do cloud mining, Jan? Um, again, uh, you know, I personally have never done cloud mining. I, I don't think it's, it's wise uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one is that historically a lot of cloud mining companies have been scams, like just outright scams. Um, there's no real way for you to know what the company is doing with your money. You send them money and then you just, you know, you assume they're mining, but maybe they're just pocketing it and paying, uh, previous users in a, some kind of, you know, Ponzi scheme, right? Um, but as far as I know, there are a few companies that do quote unquote legit cloud mining, but even still, you're basically just splitting the profits that are already marginal with this other company, right? So they have to stay in, in profit and you're locking yourself up, uh, in a contract that, you know, will last a year or however long that contract is. And at the same time, the price of Bitcoin could go up, it could go down. Um, the hash rate, which is the difficulty effectively controls the difficulty of uh, and profitability of mining could go up or down. Things could change drastically and it's, you know, you're basically locked into a contract. So from what I understand, I don't think anybody's ever made money on this <laughs> except for the money. <laughs> of course, the company offering the services, I'm sure is doing quite well. Um, but yeah, I, I, I wouldn't recommend it, especially not for Bitcoin. Okay. So, so we're not going to do Bitcoin mining and we're not going to do cloud mining, but just as a curious Bitcoin beginner, can you just give us an overview? How does Bitcoin mining work? Yeah, for sure. I think, um, again, to dispel the myth of this kind of complex equations thing that you hear about in the media, um, mining is not, an, uh, it's not a really a mathematical um, problem that needs to be solved. What really happens with mining is that we are creating a lottery system because we need a way to distribute Bitcoin, right? So um, we're creating this new type of money. And the question is, how do we distribute it, quote unquote, fairly? Uh, well, we could have a bunch of people you know, uh, sign up to to receive it and we can give it our names and you can say, you know, my, I'm Stefan, here's the proof of my ID. But the idea of, of Bitcoin is that there is no central party in charge of this distribution. And so who is going to be responsible in giving out this money? Well, Bitcoin uses a very clever idea called proof of work. Um, and so the idea there is that we're going to distribute the Bitcoins using a lottery system. But instead of having a sort of centrally run lottery system like you might have uh, in your state run, you know, lotto uh, here in America, at least we have, you know, the idea that you, you just basically buy a, a ticket and then, you know, they roll some numbers and they show them on TV and whoever won gets to claim the prize. We want to do the same idea in Bitcoin, but we don't want to have anybody in charge of running those numbers or uh, ascertaining whether you've won or not. So 
what Bitcoin does very cleverly is use the idea of proof of work. Proof of work essentially means um, playing a lottery system where you generate numbers, uh, but these numbers have to be very specific. Um, the way it works is we have essentially a, a very large space in which we are trying to find a very small uh, subset of things that, that make sense. So for example, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack, okay? We're basically rolling a die and we're generating a random number and we're putting it through, it is a mathematical formula, but it's not a complex equation. It's just a very simple thing called the hash function. Um, and what the hash function does is it produces, essentially it takes some data, which is the, the transactional data that's happening in Bitcoin, things like people trying to send Bitcoins to each other, uh, as well as um, you know the, the Bitcoins they're generating for themselves. And they're being put through this hash function to generate a very large number. And we're trying to find a specific number that's in a very, very small range in a very, very large space. Okay, so what I usually say is that there's as many outcomes to this as there are atoms in the universe. It's roughly on that order of magnitude. So think about the number of atoms in the universe and think about finding a number. You know, if I'm, if I'm thinking of a specific atom, you know, you have to find that atom, right? So how many rolls of the die will it take you to find that atom? It will take you many, many, many rolls, right? Um, and every time you roll that die, you spend a little bit of energy. Uh, so the idea is we're basically having a lottery system where miners buy lottery tickets, but instead of buying those lottery tickets from some central party, they buy them from the universe by spending energy to generate randomness. And then that randomness has to fall into, like I said, a, a small range. And if they find the right magic number uh, that's in that specific range, they, they, they show it to the rest of the network. And then the network, which is everybody else, nodes, anybody who's running a node in the Bitcoin network, which could be you or me, or you know, you don't have to have anything special, just a computer uh, or even a phone. That the everybody on the network verifies whether that miner did the right thing by seeing if if they actually, uh, you know, with the evidence that they present, does actually lead to that number. Excellent. So you mentioned the SHA-256 hashing. Can you explain for us what is actually being hashed together? Yeah, so again, um, hashing is the process of taking some data and producing essentially a random looking number. Um, and what's special about a hash function is that you can put in a very small variation to that data. So let's say I take the word, you know, a yan and I hash that word, I might get some really, really large uh, number. And then I'll uh, use the word Stefan and hash that word, I'll get a completely different, very, very large number. And even if it's like Stefan with a space, I'll get a completely different number, right? So that's how hashing works. We, we put in some data and we get these, these numbers out of them. So uh, in Bitcoin, what we do is we take the transactional data, which is any, trans, any um, movement of Bitcoins that, that needs to happen. So for example, Jan is sending, uh, you know, 0.1 Bitcoins to Stefan, right? I have announced this transaction to the network. Everybody who is mining on the network has heard about it. And then what they're going to do is they're going to take that transaction and they're going to add a random number to it. This is like the idea of rolling a die and they're going to hash it, right? So they're going to put it through the hash function and they're going to see if the number that comes out of the other side is in the right target range. Meaning is it in that small space of acceptable answers within the larger space of you know the number of atoms in the universe? Uh, that's kind of the idea. That's that's what happens to produce essentially the first block is we just we just hash that transaction. Now, it, before Bitcoin was you know widely available, what people had it, miners were just generating Bitcoins. They weren't sending the, that Bitcoin around to anybody. So one of the transactions in each uh, block, right? A block is just essentially this list of transactions that's being hashed. Uh, one of these transactions is a special one. It's called the Coinbase. And that's the one that actually produces new Bitcoins. So as a miner, you essentially take any transactions that do want to go into the block, plus a special one that grants you uh, the block reward, the reward for mining that Bitcoin. And uh, you hash that together to produce uh, a block. Now that's for the first block. Now every subsequent block does that as well, but it also uh, attaches a hash of the previous block during that hashing process. So what that does is it creates essentially a chain, a block chain, if you will. This is where we get the word blockchain, right? Uh, it's a very sexy sounding word, but all it is is it's telling us that um, blocks in Bitcoin are linked together by their hashes. And the hash essentially is proving to us uh, what the contents of that block are. 
and that the contents haven't changed. And then every hash subsequent and every block subsequent to that block is telling us that nothing prior to that block has changed leading up to it. So we can verify essentially the, all the transactions, where the Bitcoin was generated, at which block it was generated, at which block it was spent. We can kind of follow the trace of any Bitcoins that have ever existed in Bitcoin because of this idea that blocks are chained together. And putting on my Bitcoin beginner hat again, I might be thinking, well, hang on, Jan, it's all well and good that you've got to get within this certain target range, but couldn't I, as a miner, cheat that system? Couldn't I just write a number that's below the nonce? What's stopping me from doing that? Yeah, so uh, the word nonce you just used just to, for the beginners, um, it means a random number. So what we're doing is it's called it's number used only once. That's that's what nonce stands for. Um, so we're rolling this die, we're generating this number. Yeah, miners are welcome to do what they want, right? So a miner produces this hash. Um, what is a miner trying to prove in order to quote unquote win the lottery? They're trying to prove that they're taking transactions which are valid transaction, meaning they're spending coins that actually exist meaning that the people spending those coins have provided signatures, which essentially say uh, vet, prove to everybody that they own these coins. And <clears throat> they're not spending any coins that have been previously spent, right? That's called double spending. Those are kind of the basic things that make, make transactions valid. So when a, when a miner produces a block, they're telling us, uh, here are all the things, uh, all the transactions that I put into there, including that special coin-based transaction, which grants them today a 12 and a half Bitcoin reward. So every block contains in a 12 and a half Bitcoins of reward. Now, let's say they wanted to cheat that. And instead of that 12 and a half Bitcoin reward, they produce one with, you know, a thousand Bitcoins in it. Um, what's to stop them from doing that? Well, nothing. They can totally do that. Um, however, when they broadcast that block, they the trick is they need to get everybody else on the network to accept that block and put it into their block database, um, which means that any, remember, all blocks are chained together. Uh, to previous blocks, right? Um, so the network comes to a consensus on what the previous blocks have been. So if I, as a miner, produce a block that is essentially invalid because it doesn't follow the rules of Bitcoin, well, no other miner will take that block into their database. And so they won't mine on top of it. They will never link new transactions to it. Um, and also, if I, as a miner, uh, try to spend those coins to somebody who's running a node, so let's say an exchange, or a merchant selling, you know, alpaca socks or whatever it may be. Um, if you try to spend those coins, then that node will also reject those coins because they will never have that block in their database. Their node software will say, this is a counterfeit, this is a forgery, and we don't want it in our database. So no, nobody will ever consider those coins valid. How does mining work in terms of the reducing reward over time i guess there's two components to that right so what we're referring to here specifically is the block subsidy component of the block reward so why why is that block subsidy going down over time right so we have two components to the block reward as you said one of them is a subsidy which is these 12 and a half bitcoins that we generate per uh per block and then we also have the fees which are uh essentially anybody who's sending a bitcoin transaction can voluntarily select a fee um, zero or more, and essentially miners decide which transactions they want based on fees. So it's kind of a, a market-based uh, solution. But to talk about the reward, so what happened with uh, Bitcoin is Satoshi decided to have it distributed over time. Now we don't know the exact motivations of you know why he chose this specific uh, distribution curve, uh, but the way that it's designed is that uh, Bitcoin's block reward is cut in half every four years. So <clears throat> the very first Bitcoin block that was produced had 50 Bitcoins generated. And that happened for the first four years. Um, after that, we went to 25 Bitcoins for the next four years, and then we went to 12 and a half Bitcoins, which is where we are now. And we're just about to come up to uh, another halving, which is happening um, in around May of next year, which will bring us to six and a quarter Bitcoins. So why why does this happen? Well, again, this is enforced by the rules in the software. So in the software, we know that um, that at a certain block height, we the block reward should be this or that, right? Um, and so <clears throat> if you try to produce a block reward that is outside of those parameters, you're going to get rejected. So today, miners have to produce 12 and a half blocks, uh, Bitcoins per block. If they produce one that has you know 50, then that block won't be valid. That was valid you know, uh, eight years ago or whenever Bitcoin was born, 10 years ago. <laughs>
Okay, so what are some other things that might make a block invalid? So one, as you mentioned, is if the miner tries to give themselves too much reward, yep. uh, let's say, or too much block subsidy. Uh, are there any other things you can think of there that uh, would be make it an invalid block? And uh, would that... I guess, would that make it still Bitcoin or could someone, would that make it something else? Yeah, I mean, a, a block has a number of validity rules. I mean, there's there's uh, there's a lot of things, but I think the ones that I mentioned are probably the most important. Um, signatures are really, really important, right? Because the way that we determine who gets to spend Bitcoins is that we essentially lock them up into boxes where people have the keys to them. Uh, that's what we call a private key. So when I send Bitcoins to Stefan, Stefan, um, those are locked with Bitcoin uh, with Stefan's public key, essentially. That's <clears throat> corresponding to his address. And then um, when he wants to spend those, he has to unlock them by providing the private key to that uh, mailbox. Now, he doesn't actually show anybody the key. He just shows people a signature. And a signature is kind of an encrypted version uh, of the key that tells us that he does in fact control it without actually revealing it. That's kind of in layman's terms. Um, so the the idea is if you're spending Bitcoins, you have to absolutely provide the signatures. And so those are controlling who gets to move what, and those absolutely must be valid for the block. The block reward has to be correct. And obviously um, any any miscalculation really in the block is could, could trigger uh, it to be invalid. We actually recently experienced some miner that potentially had a bug in their software and granted themselves the wrong amount of reward. And, you know, that was like a $50,000 mistake right there where they had generated a block and, and basically lost all that money uh, mining and not having received the reward. So that does happen even by accident. Okay, so how about now the hash rate? So what is the hash rate and what's the relationship there with the dollar value of bitcoin yeah so um as we said you know mining is an industrial process and, and it's about miners basically burning energy uh and or burning electricity and uh what they're doing there is they're playing that lottery and they're producing uh bitcoin by by proving some to somebody that they've generated a number that is statistically improbable right so uh the issue there is, well, what happens if we have more miners, right? So let's imagine that there's just, you know, 10 miners on the network and they're all mining away. I'll have the equivalent amount of hardware. They're all doing the same thing. And then all of a sudden, uh, the price of Bitcoin is going up. And so everybody's looking around. They're saying, hey, this is really cool. We can make a lot of money. Let's go make some money. So we have 10 more miners that join the network and they start mining as well uh, because they're, you know, they want to generate Bitcoins. So that would cause Bitcoin to produce blocks too quickly, right? Uh, remember, the idea is that Satoshi programmed in this every four years, we reduce the block interval, and we want to we want Bitcoin to take a long time to actually distribute all the way to the end. It actually will be somewhere in the year 2140 that we'll finish distributing it. So if every time the price goes up and more miners want to mine and we start doing producing blocks too fast, that's that's an issue, right? We're not we're not we're gonna violate that issuance schedule. Uh, and one of the most important things about Bitcoin is its credibility with its monetary policy. So we know exactly how many Bitcoins are going to be issued at any given time. We know exactly how many total there will be and all these kind of rules, right? So more miners come into the network. What happens? How does the network deal with that? How do we prevent Bitcoin from being issued too quickly? This is, I think, the most interesting and clever part of Bitcoin, uh, and it's called the difficulty adjustment. So... This idea of how many uh, how many uh, die rolls the the miners can do per second is called the hash rate, right? How many hashes we can do per second equals how many lottery t tickets we can buy per second equals how many bitcoins we can eventually produce. So if too much hash rate comes on board, then the difficulty adjusts. So what does that mean? Well, every 2016 blocks, which is approximately two weeks. We essentially look back in history and we say, well, how fast have we been producing blocks? Is it more or less than 10 uh, minutes on average? We want to have blocks be about 10 minutes apart on average. So if blocks are coming too quickly, then we're going to increase the difficulty, which means that we're essentially shrinking that acceptable range for what those lottery tickets can end up being in. So again, imagine we're trying to hit a number in the space of all atoms in the universe and at first, the range is, acceptable range is like from zero to a billion, and then we shrink it to from a zero to a million, 
right? We've dramatically shrunk that uh, that range, and now we've made it a lot more difficult to mine. And so essentially, that's what's happening with mining, is that whenever uh, the blocks are coming too fast, we adjust the difficulty upwards, and then essentially miners become less, uh, you know, less profitable because it takes them more hashes to generate the same amount of bitcoins. And then the same thing happens in the other direction. So let's say the price of uh, of the Bitcoin is falling, and now all of a sudden it's costing miners too much in hardware, electricity, operational costs, um, and they're starting to become unprofitable. And this, this happens, uh, especially in areas where, for example, energy costs can be variable. So let's say you're in a place that gets really hot in the summer, uh, energy costs go up, heating costs go up, and all of a sudden you're actually spending more money to produce that Bitcoin than, than um, the Bitcoin's worth. Well, that's that doesn't make any sense uh, for you as an economic, you know, as a rational actor. So you're going to uh, potentially turn off those miners unless you want to uh, speculatively, speculatively run them. But most people would just curtail at that point, turn those off. And then that means the hash rate is coming off of the network. So now all of a sudden the blocks are getting too slow. Okay, well, how do we compensate for that? We make the difficulty lower, which means we make the target range bigger. So we make it easier to find that needle in the haystack because the 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 space of needles is larger. So now we're letting people, you know, we're making it more profitable to mine Bitcoin. So again, we're balancing in the other direction. And this is kind of a thing that happens all the time. Um, if you look at the uh, charts that estimate hash rate, and uh, to be clear, we um, we don't know what the hash rate actually is. We kind of estimate it based on the number of uh, blocks we're finding and, and how often we're finding them and um, that kind of thing. So we are uh, taking a guess at what the hash rate is, but we can kind of figure that out um, based on the difficulty and the, and the blocks being produced. Um, and yeah, that, that essentially uh, adjusts up and down all the time. Um, and over time, as the price of Bitcoin goes up, we just get more and more miners. So that's what we've been getting uh, for the last uh, 10 years, almost uh, on an exponential curve. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Uh, so I guess that that rise in the hash rate is coming from a number of things, right? So part of that is just better technology. Part of that is more people trying to do mining and more resources being devoted to mining, which I guess some of that is getting into this concept of the business of mining as opposed to the technical right. component of right. it itself. Do you have any just comments for the beginner in terms of how that has looked over the history of Bitcoin, like how miners have tried to somewhat play the cycle well, um, I'm not sure what, what, can you be a little bit more specific about that? Oh, just around how some miners are effectively, they're sort of speculating into the oh, into right, future right. of, yeah, so they have to somewhat speculate, oh, okay, I think the hash rate is going to rise this much, and that's why I need to be careful what projects I undertake, yeah, 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 because yeah. You know, this number of machinery. Right, we've definitely yeah. seen, I mean, to, you know, the history of Bitcoin mining is started with just people on laptops, right? We used to have it was okay to mine with CPUs because the difficulty was very low. So everybody was just mining on their computer and then eventually it turned into GPUs, which are, you know, graphics cards. And eventually we got to the point where everybody was manufacturing custom hardware. And this is, again, that sort of race to the bottom where everybody's trying to get as, as efficient as possible because the more efficient you are at generating hashes, the more you can kind of outcompete the other guy. Um, but it's also possible to grow too quickly. Um, and if you grow very, very, very fast and, you know, you, you kind of, um, balloon your operation, then all of a sudden a bear market hits and the price of Bitcoin tanks, now you may be in a bad spot. So it's actually very tricky. I mean, we've seen miners go out of business. Uh, we've seen new miners come on board in places, you know, like Iceland or uh, far reaches of, you know, Canada where we have um, uh, cheaper power. So I think the the interesting thing about the, the, uh, the business cycle here is that uh, the price of Bitcoin as it goes up, creates more mining uh, interest. People want to mine. They think it's kind of free money. They start building businesses around it. And then a bear market hits. And if it's a brutal bear market, it really does a great job of washing away any inefficiency because, um, you know, unless you're you're able to sustain uh, long-term operations throughout, you know, potentially a year-long bear market, uh, you're, you're out of luck and you're going out of business. And we've seen even giant uh, companies like Bitmain, who was a huge player, um, suffer tremendous losses, especially since they, of course, took a position in, in Bitcoin Cash or Bcash, as we like to call it. <laughs> that was a mistake. But um, you know that if you make a mistake as a miner, you don't have a lot of room for error, really, because you are really competing in a hyper efficient uh, market where somebody who's got slightly cheaper power than you and slightly better ex uh, equipment 
and a slightly better operations team, you know, you're toast. Uh, so I think what we're going to see in mining is very exciting because um, we recently just heard the announcement about Layer One, which is a company building a data center out in Texas where they're going to try to vertically integrate. They're going to produce their own hardware. They're going to essentially have their own power plant or a substation. Um, and they're going to run that whole operation vertically integrated. So what that's going to do is it's going to make their cost of producing Bitcoin very, very low compared to other players. And so that's going to mean that everybody's got to step up their game because otherwise they're going to be left in the dust. The difficulty will adjust upwards and everybody will become unprofitable. So I think the next couple of years of mining are going to be very interesting to see that play out. Great. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about mining attacks now. So there's one attack known as an empty blocks attack. What's that? Yeah. So um, people talk about a 51% attack in mining, which is essentially the idea that if you have more than half of the hash power of the network, you can dominate the production of blocks, right? Because if you think about it as a lottery, then you know you toss a coin, and if that coin is not fair, and uh, more you're getting heads more of the time, then you're winning those blocks. You're being able to produce uh, more blocks than the next guy. Um, and then the way that the Bitcoin consensus works is that we just go with whatever chain has the most proof of work, right? Uh, meaning that whoever's expended the most amount of hash rate gets to uh, produce those blocks and those will be considered valid by the system as long as they follow all the other rules. So uh, what does it mean if you have more than half of the, uh, the hash power of the network? Well, it means you can dominate the rights to the ledger. So um, let's say uh, you know, you're know you producing, the, the chain is five blocks long and you're producing the sixth block and the seventh block and the rest of the network isn't able to keep up with you, right? So now that you're producing essentially every block or you can eventually make a ch longer chain, you control what goes into those blocks. So one of the things you can do is you can mine empty blocks, um, which essentially will prevent Bitcoin from working because you know no, nobody will be able to transact. They will submit transactions, but they'll never make it into the database. Uh, they'll never make it into the actual ledger of Bitcoin, which is those blocks. So that's an attack that you can definitely do. Uh, however, it's very, very expensive to do. So it requires you to not only control half half of the, uh, well, in order to control half of the hash rate, you pretty much have to have half of the hardware and you know half of the uh, the energy expenditure of the network. And you know, as as people like to say, a lot of times in the media when they when they're like making fun of Bitcoin, is we spend like as much energy as as a small or medium sized country on this thing. Uh, and that's a great, that's, that's how we keep it secure, right? Because in order to attack Bitcoin, you're going to need to amass the resources of a country <laughs> to, to produce those uh, blocks faster than the competition. Um, and while you're doing that, of course, the competition is going to also step up their game and try to compete with you. So it's a very interesting system that way. Right. And uh, I think you're also making the point there that it's not a one-time shot attack, in order to do this sort of attack, it's a sustained expenditure enough that people, I guess, lost faith in the idea of Bitcoin ever coming back. Yeah, I, absolutely. I think, you know, people will, will talk about this a lot, but the the they'll talk about the 51% attack as if it's something that's like we could just do it any day. First of all, we haven't really seen it. Um, and part of the reason might be that, you know, all the miners are just co like uh, committed philosophically to mining Bitcoin and they don't want to attack it. Uh, but I think the real reason is that you can't really sustain it indefinitely, right? I mean, you can sustain it for an hour, a day, you know, maybe even a week, right? Depending on how much, how it's it's all about the resources. If it's a nation state and they want to like print money infinitely to sustain an attack on Bitcoin, I mean, they could do it. Uh, the question is, what what does that do though, right? So yes, you can prevent the chain from moving forward by mining empty blocks. But if it's really a, an attack that's sustained for weeks, First of all, uh, you're you're essentially competing against every other player on the planet. I mean, there will be mining operations that can just add hardware and and uh, overcome you. But even if somehow by some magic you have a you know a, essentially so much money that you're printing these ASIC uh, mining machines and you're printing your own electricity, essentially you know you're 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 wasting the resources of the state to do that. Um, I mean, still we could fork. We could fork the algorithm that we use, right? And that would instantly invalidate all of your attack. Uh, and so I think even the, the fact that that kind of thing could be ha could happen makes any kind of even attempt at attack sort of impractical because, uh, you know, what's the point? You're 
you may you get to do it once and then what you start all over right you have to build your hardware from scratch everything from scratch right it could be thought of like that's the that's the going nuclear option, right? right. That's yeah. the if everything else fails, <laughs> switch the proof of work algorithm. Yeah, and I don't think it's going to be easy. I mean, I don't think it's going to be easy to do that. But if Bitcoin is truly quote unquote broken and like there's nothing we can do about it, then I think we will find consensus around some variation of that alg- algorithm that will, um, you know, allow essentially to re rise from the ashes. And it won't be exactly the same. It'll be kind of a, a different uh, system. But you know, we will destroy the entire mining industry if we do that um we'll have to start from scratch but uh again it, it would be possible and bitcoin will be reborn and even if it takes years to rebuild it it'll be reborn so i think even the idea that it's impossible to kill it that way prevents uh, these attacks from happening because it doesn't really make sense to to waste all your resources you might as well just like amass bitcoin and join the join the party <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> exactly right yeah i think uh maybe put it another way it, it's like it's part of the threat of a proof of work change might be enough to stop somebody trying to attack bitcoin because they know even if they did then all the bitcoin people might just switch out to another algorithm right i mean and that wouldn't be a simple task but it would at least act as some kind of deterrent against somebody trying to do that attack. Yeah, I I, I think so. I'm, you know, we don't have any proof of this. We don't know what's going to happen in speculation, but you know, if you kind of play out the game theory intuitively, it kind of makes sense because if you're going to kill Bitcoin, you have to kill it dead. And I don't see any way that you can kill it in a way that it won't, you know, resurrect in some other form. Right. Um, So what's the point? (laughs) Right. Yeah. Uh, And I guess the other question that somebody might be worried about if they're a bitcoin beginner the risk of centralization or you know and mining centralization and so i guess there are probably three main axes on which to consider this right so one of them is literally the mining pools another one is the geographic you know location of mining and another one might be around the manufacture of the hardware of mining. So do you have any thoughts just on that and whether we're seeing increasing decentralization in that over time? Yeah, so with pools, um, to, for the newbies out there, a pool is basically the idea that, you know, because Bitcoin mining is a lottery, uh, it's possible that you can just play this lottery and never win it. So you could just sit there, you know, with your computer churning, uh, burning energy, you just never, you'll never land the block. Um, so pools have arisen as a way to share that risk. So people basically connect to the pool and they share their hash rate. And then if a block is found by a member of the pool, then everybody gets paid out proportionally to what they've contributed. Um, but we've seen over the years that pools have really changed. I mean, pools have come and gone. Um, there was a pool, I believe in 2014, this happened uh, with Ghash that did amass close to 50% of the hash, but people left it. Um, so it's important to realize that pools are simply, they're temporary structures and they're essentially voluntary associations of people, uh, of, of smaller mining operations. So those mining operations, if they suspect the pool is acting maliciously or doing something they don't like, um, could simply leave. Uh, I think we're going to see a more interesting evolution of pools with uh, the better hash proposal. Um, right now, that's kind of a thing that uh, Matt Corrello put together. Uh, it's an idea that uh, right now, the pool itself decides what is it going into the block that you're mining. So you're literally just being kind of a dumb, you know, hash producer. You're just, you, you, they give you data and you hash it. Um, with better hash, you as the miner have more control over what goes into the block. So that prevents the pool from doing a lot of malicious things. So hopefully we'll see that. I know that there's a pool coming. I believe it's a Blockstream branded pool that's coming um, with better hash enabled. So uh, I think once that happens, it will, we'll probably see miners uh, choose that because it's, it's way better for Bitcoin. Uh, it's better for decentralization. So I'm I'm hopeful that, that will really change the pool story uh, because today it is true that there's probably three or four pools you could put together that would be uh, 50% of of the hash rate. But again, pools are not miners, right? So they could if we if that were to happen and those pools were to collude in some fashion, um, those those miners would leave. And again, this is an attack they get to do once. And then it's quite known and nobody will ever use those pools again. So it's the same kind of nuclear option as, as the, you know, empty block attack or anything like that, where, uh, you know, what's the point? Why are they doing that? Uh, if they're being coerced by some state, again, what's the point? Why, how are they going to kill Bitcoin this way? They're not really going to. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's addressing pools. Uh, as far as geographic, 
Um, yeah, I mean, we do know that there's a lot of mining going on in China. It's it's really hard to say where mining is because a lot of these things are undisclosed operations. So a lot of it's from you know just known operations or voluntary disclosure. Um, we do know that China is a leader in mining. It doesn't mean that that's going to be the case forever. Obviously, like I mentioned, uh, Layer 1 um, is an interesting effort to bring a lot of mining power to America. And if that's successful, I don't see why we wouldn't replicate that in all over the uh, America, all over Canada, uh, other places where we can get cheaper power. And I think we're going to see a lot of innovation, too. We're going to see power innovation. We're going to see people setting up mining in places that we didn't think were going to be profitable before. Uh, we're going to see energy companies maybe reclaiming some of their curtailed uh, energy because we have companies like shutting down power production because they're overproducing. Um, perhaps mining uh, starts to live inside of uh, energy producers. Uh, perhaps we see a mining on uh, oil fields like we're we're doing with Upstream Data and other uh, companies like that. So I think that's going to really change the decentralization game with mining. And then what was the third one? <laughs> Uh, around hardware manufacturer. Oh, so hardware, I think yeah. in this case, it would be around um, fab. Like, so I guess there's a few things. There's the miners themselves, and then there's the chip fab, the underlying chip fab. Right. So there's components. Well, we heard that. about Samsung supposedly entering the game. I don't know where they are with this. I've kind of not followed it. I know there's been some touch and go there. Uh, but again, I mean, if it's a profitable industry, why wouldn't more more people compete in it? I think we're still early. Um, and I think that we're in a place where there was massive gains to be had early on and, and people build out these labs and try to, you know, kind of front run uh, generating new generations of these things. Uh, people like Bitmain would produce the, the chips and then run their own miners. But uh, we're getting to the point where mining hardware is getting commoditized. The designs uh, are well known. Um, how far we can shrink those transistors is kind of uh, hitting the wall. So once that happens, we're going to see more companies play and uh, it will be a commodity, you know, like anything else, right? Like GPUs are now. Um, and so we will see, I think, more decentralization there as well. Yeah. And now as a Bitcoin beginner, let's say I have sent a Bitcoin transaction and sometimes it can confirm really quickly and other times it confirms really, it takes a long time. Now, what is a Poisson distribution and how does that apply? Um, yeah, so... Uh, you might hear that Bitcoin blocks come 10 minutes apart on average. Uh, so what the, what does that mean? Does that mean uh, we release a block every 10 minutes? No, because it's, again, it's a probability game, right? Bitcoin mining is a statistical uh, game where we're rolling a die and we're trying to guess a number. And again, it could, it could take, a, it could theoretically take all day. It could take all month, right? Um, so Bitcoin blocks are produced 10 minutes on average. If you take all the blocks and you average them out over, let's say a two week period, like we do for the difficulty adjustments, you will find that it is about 10 minutes. But uh, unless of course, there's been more or less hash power added or subtracted. But the reality is that for any given block, right, the time to the next block could be 20 minutes, it could be an hour, right? We, we don't know when a block is coming. Um, so the real answer is like, if you ask, you know, at this point in time, when is the next, when are we likely to see the next block? The answer is always, 10 minutes, right? It's always going to take 10 minutes to produce the next block uh, <laughs> on average. Um, but uh, because of the way that blocks are, you know, sometimes they're very close together, they could be seconds apart, sometimes it could be an hour apart. Um, if you were to throw a dart, like let's imagine that the um, the block times are all written out on a, on a line, right? And you kind of see the blocks come in close together, close together, very a uh, few seconds apart, then you see a really big space for one that took, you know, 30 minutes or 40 minutes. Uh, if you're just to throw a dart, you're actually more likely to land in a bigger space than you are in a smaller space. Uh, and so this is why there's this effect of like, that your transactions always actually take longer to confirm than, uh, than the average, right? Because, uh, you know, by sampling it that way, it's actually more like 20 minutes. Uh, so it's kind of a weird statistical, <laughs> statistical thing is hard to understand. But I think for the for the beginner, um, the more relevant thing to understand is that there is no guarantee whatsoever about when your block, when your transaction will be confirmed, which is a little bit scary, but also kind of fun. Um, <laughs> it also depends on the block times, right? Uh, sorry, the block, um, uh, sorry, the block capacity, right? So when you're when you're submitting a transaction, uh, you're waiting for the next block to come, and that block may or may not include your transaction. If there's a lot of demand and other people are paying more in fees, well, they're going to get included and you're going to have to wait until the next block. 
So it's very, it's a little bit random. Um, but on the other hand, within, you know, let's say an hour, it's almost certainly going to be confirmed. And uh, the more you wait, the more certainty you get with that. And with the, the way that the blockchain is structured with the proof of work, the more blocks that are mined on top of your transaction, the more final it becomes, right? The, the harder it becomes to reverse because in order to reverse, you'd have to uh, do one of these sort of 51% attacks and expend lots and lots of energy. Yeah, so basically what we've spoken through is one of the key sections from your book, Inventing Bitcoin. Did you mind telling us what are your thoughts on where should the listener think of situating this book? If they're trying to learn about Bitcoin, what's the book that you should read before this? And then what's the book that you should read next Yeah, I, after Inventing Bitcoin? Yeah, I think that, um, well, the book that I read that really resonated with me the most in the space was uh, The Bitcoin Standard, uh, which I think is a great book for people without a uh, economic background, um, like myself, like I'm more of a technical person. And, um, when I read that book, it made me really understand how money works in general. So I would really recommend to readers, um, to read the, the Bitcoin standard, to understand the economics of Bitcoin, because that's something that I don't really, uh, talk about as much in the book. My book is more about how Bitcoin works, uh, from, you know, the nuts and bolts, you know, how does mining work, how do transactions get into the ledger, that kind of thing. Um, but on the other hand, it is very short, and I also do cover the motivations for Bitcoin. So I cover some of the whys and some of the uh, writings of Satoshi. I think those are uh, valuable in understanding why he wanted to create the system. So um, I like my book as an intro book, and I give it to people who are slightly technically minded, whereas to people who are more uh, sort of generalists, I really like to give Safe's book, uh, The Bitcoin Standard, because it does give them that nice economic overview. Um, as far as afterwards, I think some of the deeper books, um, obviously, if you're a developer, I would recommend Andreas's uh, Mastering Bitcoin. That's always popular. Very, It goes very much in depth. It's, it's you know, there's code and stuff like that. My book does not get into code. It really just very high level. And uh, yeah, I think uh, Andreas's book would be a good one, as well as Jimmy Song's Programming block <coughs> Blockchain, if you're, uh, or sorry, Programming Bitcoin. <laughs> I uh, used to have a course called Programming Blockchain, but um, yeah, the book's called Programming Bitcoin. Uh, very good book uh, relating to that course as well. But yeah, that's for technical people. If you're if you're not technical, I think you'd get by with uh, the Bitcoin standard as well as my book. I think you'd get by just fine. Great. I also was curious, I think you, you had some interesting comments around how Silicon Valley and tech people, they often make a certain error in reasoning or thinking about Bitcoin because they accidentally making you money without realizing <laughs> what were you getting at there um yeah i actually you know i went through this process myself effectively because when i got into bitcoin in 2016 ethereum was making a big a lot of noise right and um i heard about bitcoin in 2011 but again i never researched it so um in 2016 when i did start researching i looked at ethereum first and they had really good marketing and it was all, uh, you know, you can create a bank in a hundred lines of code. It was very exciting as a developer for me. It looked very, very attractive. Um, and I asked other developers as well, and they they said, yeah, we heard of Ethereum. It looks like you can create these really cool financial constructs in a very small amount of code. So I really went down that rabbit hole for probably six months, studying Ethereum, studying all these other um, blockchain projects and stuff like that. And it wasn't really until um, I started reading some of the economic thought, uh, around Bitcoin, actually part of the reason why I found your podcast, uh, Stefan, um, I started understanding the, um, the economics of Bitcoin, the monetary aspects, uh, the Austrian economic stuff. And what that led me to is understanding that Bitcoin is money. Um, and so if it is money, right, what crypto has done is it's created a free market competition for money, which we've never really had. Well, not in recent times, right? Back in the day, we did have free market money, which was gold. Um, we had other metals that competed for that, but they lost that battle because gold was the hardest and the most saleable. And so if you think about that, um, in crypto, we have no barriers, right? We don't have a nation state. We don't have the government saying, you must use this currency here. Because if you go to Venezuela today, nobody in Venezuela wants to use bolivars, right? That's something imposed by the government. If they could have their choice, they would much rather take U.S. dollars. That's a much better currency, right? It's more liquid. It's more saleable. It holds its value better. Uh, and that's why the world, frankly, always uses U.S. dollars, right? If there's a black market anywhere in the world, it's pretty much a U.S. dollar black market because um, as far as fiat currencies go, the U.S. dollar is the most liquid, the most saleable, and the best uh, sort of value. But in crypto, 
we don't have nation states. So nobody's protecting one crypto from competing with another on its monetary properties. And so what does that mean? Well, basically, um, if you buy Ethereum, well, you either think that Ethereum is money, that Ether is money, right? Or you're speculating on Ether as a project of some kind, and you're eventually going to sell that Ether for money. Uh, well, what is money? Well, money is the most saleable and hardest thing in the free market, which is Bitcoin, right? So you're either going to be selling that Ether, Ether for Bitcoin, or you're going to be selling it for US dollars if you don't believe in Bitcoin, um, which makes it so that any of these projects that maybe they're interesting ideas, maybe they have some technical merit, right? But by virtue of the fact that they produce a coin, something that trades like a money in a free market against Bitcoin, they're basically creating a losing proposition for themselves because nobody wants to hold those things long term. And this was kind of the idea of this, you know, people try to create this utility token thesis where they said, well, people are going to hold these tokens because they're going to appreciate in value for this or that reason. But maybe in a closed ecosystem, they would. But you're always forgetting that they're competing against Bitcoin, which is the hardest and most saleable money. So um, from that perspective, I think anybody who's creating these projects with uh, these sort of native tokens, they're kind of forgetting that um, they're inadvertently creating money. And uh, people are going to eventually have to hold the money that's actually appreciating value, which is, or at least holding its value, which is Bitcoin. So that's going to cause all these tokens to reduce in value. And if that happens, then uh, especially if they're doing something like providing security for, for the system, like Ether is supposed to be the money of Ethereum because it has to provide uh, security. Uh, it has to pay the miners, right? So that's security for e Ethereum. And then um, it also has to act as money for any of these sort of DeFi uh, ideas that are floating around, right? Like people are saying, we can issue loans on, on Ethereum. Well, you have to lock up Ether and, and pretend that it's money. Um, but if it's not money, which means it's not the most saleable and hardest thing, well, then <laughs> it's not going to retain the, the monetary premium and it's going to go down in price and the whole thing's going to fall apart. And so that's kind of what I've realized. And I think that um, it's funny because tech people, of which I am one, I would I would definitely classify myself as, as a tech person. They actually fall into these scams like much more readily than than people with an economic background. Um, so once I started listening to people with an economic background, I started realizing how how none of this makes any sense, <laughs> which it does. It does on paper. <laughs> uh, on paper, it totally does. I mean, the marketing is very good, but the the reality of it, yeah, it's free market competition, and people are just not going to hold this stuff. Right. Yeah. No, that's great. Look, I think we're pretty much coming out of time, running out of time here. Uh, but Jan, before we let you go, can you make sure you tell the listeners where they can find inventing Bitcoin and where they can find you online? Yeah, definitely. So I'm on Twitter. Uh, my handle is Scoop, which is S-K-W-P. It's a very strange name I chose when I was 14. If you hit me in DMs, I'll explain it. Uh, and then you can also get the book on Amazon or at inventingbitcoin.com where you can pay with Bitcoin if you want, but I don't recommend it because I have to go through all the work of sending you the book. Plus, you have to KYC yourself to me. You don't want to do that. Just buy it on Amazon. But if you do want to give me your sats, I will take them. I will gladly take them off your hands. So yeah, buy it at inventingbitcoin.com or Amazon and uh, find me on Twitter, SKWP. All right. Thank you very much for joining me. All right. Thank you, Stefan. It was, it was a pleasure.